Hi, it's time for another verb of the day. Today's verb is override. And this verb was suggested by the viewer Luis. So thank you so much for this suggestion. It's been a lot of fun to think about all of the different ways we can use this verb. Let's take a look at some of those meanings or definitions. The first way the verb override gets used is to mean to overrule, set aside, or nullify. Now, if you're a regular watcher of my videos, you might notice that I use a lot of examples from politics and law. Uh, that's something I enjoy reading about, listening to, understanding. And my mind, of course, immediately went to this first definition. So uh, the way the U.S. government works, um, our legislature can pass a law, but then it needs to be signed by the president. But if the president does not sign it, it can go back to the Congress. They can vote, and if they secure two-thirds of a majority, then we say they override the president's veto or the refusal to sign. So that first definition is used quite a lot uh, as we talk about uh, things becoming law um, here in the United States. A second way the verb override gets used can mean to take precedence, prevail, have dominance over, or have the final say. So with this definition, it, it might help to think of maybe two situations, right? So the first would be think of uh, a parent and teenager, right? Sometimes the teenager makes a certain decision, right? But the parent goes, no, 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 right? You're not going to do that. Right? The parent has the final say. They override whatever the teenager is expressing as a wish or desire. Similarly, uh, in workplaces, a uh, one level of employee might make a decision, decide to do something, right? And a supervisor, or a boss, a manager, or someone above them might say, no, 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 we're not going to do it that way. They change the decision. They have precedence or final say over what's going to be done. A third way you might encounter the verb override can mean to counteract or neutralize the normal operation of an automatic control. Before I was an English teacher, uh, I worked in the field of accounting and tax law. So I used a, a lot of computer programs to help produce uh, tax returns. And sometimes there were special situations where we needed a certain thing to appear in a place uh, and the software just wasn't designed or programmed to do that. So we would have to counteract, do certain things to uh, make the form look like we knew it needed to be. So we were kind of going around that normal operation. In other words, we were overriding the software. A fourth way you might hear override use can mean to extend beyond, spread over, or overlap. So now, as you think about this uh, particular verb, maybe your mind is going to a place where right, you have something kind of going over the edge, spilling over, spreading over. A fifth way you might hear override use can mean to ride over, across, past, or beyond. So now with this fifth definition and, and even a little bit with the sixth um, that I know we haven't looked at here, we're going back really to the, the meaning of our verb ride and the um, uh, pre prefix here, over, right? So over is a prefix can mean across, past, or beyond. A sixth way that uh, override can be used uh, it's probably more, more common with horses, so riding an animal too much or too hard, um, that it might not be able to continue. For now, you should know that override is an irregular verb. To make the progressive form of this verb, you're going to drop the E on the end because our verb ends with a vowel, a consonant, and then an E. When you add that ing suffix, it forms overriding. 
The past tense and participle forms are going to match our irregular forms of the verb ride. So in the past tense, we're going to pronounce it over road, right? So we're changing I to O. And in the participle, we're going to say overridden, overridden. So the sound of that I changes from a long I to a short I. Okay, hope that will help you remember it. So if you could, if you know the irregulars for ride, then you're going to know the irregulars for override. Now you might be relieved to know that we don't have phrasal verbs to practice and discuss. So we can move on to some more examples. Today I thought we would review the simple past tense and the present perfect. Let's start with the simple past tense. We use this verb tense to talk about completed actions at a known point in the past. Many times our simple past tense sentences have time signals. This could be a word like yesterday, could be something like three weeks ago, or even a specific date in the past. But not every sentence in the simple past tense is going to have a time signal. Sometimes that's implied as part of a conversation or a longer passage. Okay. Now, the nice thing about making sentences in the simple past tense is that our structure stays the same no matter what our subject is. So in the affirmative, we're going to have our subject and then we're going to have that irregular form of the verb. You can see that in my example. The state legislature overrode the governor's veto of the election bill last night. Okay. So again, goes back to the first definition of the verb that we discussed a bit earlier. Now let's look at making negative sentences in the simple past tense. To do this, I start with my subject. I use did not or the contraction didn't and then the base verb. So here I'm not using the irregular form in the negative. Let's look at another example. The invaders didn't override the small group of defenders. Okay. So that could go back to that meaning of prevail. It could mean kind of that overtaking um, in, in taking up more area, spilling over, spreading over. Right. Finally, let's look at making a yes or no question in the simple past tense. To do this, start with did, then have your subject, and then the base verb. You can see that in the example. Did the FAA initially override its own engineers to ground the planes? So this uh, sentence might seem very complex, per, especially if you're living outside of the United States. So FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration, kind of the government department that oversees flying, uh, transportation uh, in the air. So here, um, this question actually is something that got asked uh, during a period of time where certain planes were being kept on the ground. They were not being allowed to fly. Okay, So uh, there were questions about whether engineers and other safety professionals had evaluated and decided, are the planes safe to be in the air or are they not? Right, And here we're, we're sort of asking, did the... Uh, leaders of this government department, did they sort of st step in and have that final say? Now let's move on and talk about the present perfect verb tense. We use this verb tense in a couple of, of different situations. Sometimes we use it to describe an action that started in the past and one that continues into the present. But we can also use it to describe something that happened at an unknown point in the past. Sometimes this gets a little bit confusing comparing simple past tense and present perfect. So uh, with simple past, think or remember it is a known period, right? It might not always be communicated in that particular sentence, but the speaker or the writer um, is acknowledging when that action um, occurred, right? With the present perfect, Hmm, maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was last week, maybe it was 20 years ago, we don't know. And sometimes that just doesn't matter. Now, when we make sentences in the present perfect, 
we need to pay attention to our subject. If the subject is I, you, we, or they, you're going to use have, and then that third form of our verb, our participle form. If the subject is he, she, or it, use has, and then the participle form the verb. You can see that in the example. You have overridden a field when you shouldn't have. That's why it isn't calculating correct, correctly. So again, maybe you can imagine people at work working through some kind of uh, technical program. There's something that just isn't right. And ah, someone uh, went and, and sort of broke an automatic control or an automatic function. They uh, have overridden it. Now, let's take a look at negative present perfect sentences. Again, we want to uh, pay attention uh, to, our, uh, to our subject. If our subject is he, she, it, we'll use has, not, and then the participle form. But if the subject is I, you, we, or they, use have, not, and then the participle form. Here's another example. Giant waves haven't overridden the beach in years. Okay. So we've got a negative action, something that hasn't occurred. So we're going back uh, and continuing now into the present here. And this would be like that spread over definition that we talked about. Um, so kind of you can imagine waves really moving further inland um, is, is really what that sentence is about. Finally, Let's take a look at making a yes or no question in the present perfect. To do this, start with have or has, then you're going to have your subject, then the participle form of the verb. Here's another example. Have budgetary concerns overridden all other considerations? Now, this question is going to go back and be an example of our second definition. Uh, you might think of that kind of take precedence, maybe be most important beyond all other concerns. So it might be a question um, a board of directors is asking as they make some type of plan. Somebody wants to know, right, is this controlling or taking precedence over all other issues and, and matters that are being considered. Now, let's spend a moment looking at a word related to our verb override. And what we're going to discuss today is just the noun form of that word. So the noun override has exactly the same spelling and exactly the same pronunciation as our verb. The noun override can also have a number of different meanings. We're going to discuss three of them today. So the first way you hear override used as a noun is to refer to some kind of mechanism or system that counteracts an automatic control, right? So sort of maybe does the opposite, stops something that would otherwise be automatic. An example of this might be, you may request an override of the registration restrictions by clicking here. Okay. Saw something similar uh, to this um, recently as I was helping a, a student register for some classes. Sometimes in these automatic systems, it will say like you must have this class as a prerequisite, right? But Sometimes there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, and I was working with somebody who had one of those exceptions and was trying to figure out, well, how do I still register for this class when the system is telling me I can't, right? So we found a way to request an override, something that's going to counteract that uh, system that's not allowing the person to register. A second way to use the noun override is to talk about the act or instance of nullifying um, something. An example of this, an override of the veto will be tough to secure. Sometimes that is debated as um, bills uh, get passed by very small margins, might be by a, a simple majority. Right? And you might remember earlier uh, in at the federal level, and I believe most states, uh, to override a veto, uh, you need two thirds um, of the uh, of the voting body 
to vote in favor of that. So this sentence here is saying, oh, that act of nullifying the veto, it's going to be tough to do. A third way the noun override gets used is to talk about an excess or an increase. And that could be in budget, in salary, or cost. An example of how you might see this used. The school district is asking voters to approve an 8% budget override next month. Right? So again, they're talking about an increase here. Thank you so much for watching today's video and a special thanks to Luis for making this suggestion. Have a great day, everyone.